Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe we'll all get started so you can get every bit of minute with uh, Joe Ellis that you deserve this afternoon. Um, my name is Jerry Cardone. I'm on the Authors Committee, and I'm also the Library Director here in Brattleboro. This year's festival is presented by Downtown Alliance. It is made possible with generous support by these sponsors, Marlboro College, the Vermont Humanities Council, and Vermont Public Radio. Marlboro College sponsorship is thanks to David and Nike Spelt in honor of Nike's father, David Friedman. We would also like to thank all the advertisers and encourage you to patronize them sometime during your stay here in Brattleboro. The festival is run completely by volunteers, but has very low expenses, so we encourage you to make donations. We have some cuts and class boxes for that, and uh, we hope that you do so. So welcome to our 13th annual literary festival. I guess we're a teenager now, so uh, hope there, hopefully there won't be any acting out, but uh, I especially wish to welcome uh, Joseph J. Ellis to the festival. Dr. Ellis is one of the nation's leading scholars of American history. The author of eight books, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Founding Brothers, The Revolutionary Generation, and won the National Book Award for American Sphinx, a biography of Thomas Jefferson. Dr. Ellis' most recent book, which is now on the paperback, is Revolutionary Summer, The Birth of American Independence, and there'll be some for sale after this event, and he'll be here to autograph them. His essays and book reviews appear regularly in national publications, and I'm sure you have seen him on the PBS documentary on John and Ab Abigail Adams that aired some years ago. He currently teaches in the Leadership Studies Program at Williams College. He previously taught at Mount Holyoke College and at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Dr. Ellis is a historian's historian. Fred Kaplan, a fellow historian who will, you, who you will hear this afternoon, speak on John Quincy Adams at the library, said, says that Joe is undoubtedly the most knowledgeable person writing on John Adams and the early republic today. His prose is brilliant and seamless. One, one reviewer says, how could you not love a book by a distinguished American scholar whose descriptions of historical figures ring with the vividness of paintings and the economy of aphorisms? Here is a description of Thomas Jefferson from Revolutionary Summer that totally changed my vision of this man. As slightly over six foot two with reddish blonde hair and erect posture described as straight as a gun barrel, he possessed the physical attributes of a Virginia grandee, but he had a weak and reedy voice that did not project in large spaces. He was also by description self-contained, some combination of aloof and shy, customarily standing silently in groups, with his arms folded tightly around his chest, as if to ward off the troops. Dr. Ellis' next book, The Quartet, Orchestrating the Second American Revolution, is due out in the spring of 2015. It's the story of the Constitutional Convention orchestrated by four leaders of the day, Washington, Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay. Be watching the bookstores and the library shelves uh, for that one. And finally, I love this quote about him. Joe Ellis says for magazine is the Roger Federer of historians. <laughs> so please welcome to Radical Center Court. Plymouth that we 
live in part of the year, and she teaches skiing at her chemo, um, making eight dollars an hour plus two. <laughs> and, um, um, and, um, and I think of Vermont as perhaps the greenest state in the union, and, um, and my major obsession with public policy these days is, is global warming. My son is a forest ecologist of the Nature Conservancy, one of my sons, and um, I just want to, th this, this is on my mind, so I share it with you and use the podium to, to uh, proselytize. But you know how they talk about canaries in the coal mine? Take a look at the time yesterday, the picture of the walruses on the coastline of uh, Alaska. There's 35,000 walruses there because there's no ice work to be on. The walruses on the ground are the new canary in the coal mine. And if we don't do something about this, our children and grandchildren and their children will live in a world that is almost uninhabitable. Um, the fact that the government of the United States is incapable of doing anything about this is more than great. Well, 100 years from now, when they look back at the Congress of the United States, they're going to say that this is pretty much like the 17th century moment when the church fathers persecuted Galileo because he believed that the earth was not the center of the universe. I don't really claim to be an expert on that. I'm just a citizen who cares a lot about it. I am an American historian of the late 18th century. Why do you study those, those folks back there so much and spend so much of your time with them? And I've come up with the Willie Sutton answer. That's where the money is. Remember Willie Sutton? He was a bank robber back in the 50s. We are all of the same age and we remember that. And, um, Believe me, when I'm at Williams and I say this, they have the biggest idea. <laughs> and, um, um, and Willie used to get caught all the time robbing banks. He was a great bank robber, but he kept getting caught. He was a lovable guy. And, uh, and so finally they said, Willie, you, know, you keep robbing banks and you keep getting caught. Why do you keep robbing banks? And he said, because that's where they keep the money. <laughs> and uh, late well, 18th century is when we keep the money in the sense that the ideas and values and the institutions that we continue to live with were first created. And so in some ways we can never know enough about those people. Um, this magisterial book um, <laughs> is about the summer of, of 1776. And the main argument of the book is that there are two stories going on at the same time that historians have treated as separate stories but are really a single story. The most famous side of these is the political story with its center in Philadelphia and the Continental Congress. And you can see a play like 1776, which makes popular at that moment, gets right the notion that Adams is the most important figure at that time. The other epicenter, however, and the other story is a military story. And it's going on at the same time. The British are landing 42,000 troops, the largest amphibious force ever to cross the Atlantic until the World War I, in order to, to crush the American rebellion in the cradle. They're landing on Staten Island and then to Long Island. So the other epicenter is the Continental Army in Washington who's going to try to stop this invasion and end up getting squashed. And um, so those are two stories, again, told separately, but I say have to be brought together. And they interact and influence one another and shape the way history happened. It's a really close call here um, because the Continental Army is almost annihilated. And so an interesting question would be, what would have happened? if in fact General and Admiral Howe had decided, and they had it in their power to do it, um, to completely capture and or annihilate the Continental Army, including Washington. Would the rebellion have ceased? This was in August of 1776, so, and the fleet landed on July 2nd, the very day the Continental Congress voted on independence. Um, that's what it's about, but you still have to buy the book now. <laughs> <laughs>
A couple, not a couple, four questions are going to shape my remarks here. Here's the first one, and it's a question to which I don't have a good answer. I have an answer, as you'll see, but it's, it's not satisfactory to me. I call it the Wilkes-Barre question. I presume no one here has ever had the misfortune to be born and raised in Wilkes-Barre, but um, Wilkes-Barre today has a population approximately twice the size of Virginia in 1776. Now, if we went down the streets of Wilkes-Barre today, and we looked real hard, do you think we could find George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, and John Marshall. No. Nope. We couldn't find them. Now this is another question. Are they there? Yeah. They're there. There is the potential for leadership present in any kind of and it's not whether it's there, but whether it rises to the surface, whether it, the latent leadership abilities present in a society are allowed or almost forced to emerge. And so what is it about this moment in American history that does produce what is I think, without much question, the greatest collection of political leaders we have. Now, this itself is a politically incorrect position, since these are all dead white males, and um, blah, blah, blah. I'll throw Abigail in just for general. Uh, um, one kind of explanation comes from uh, the British historian Arnold Toynbee, who wrote this two-volume work called The Study of History, published in the 1940s. It's the kind of book that your parents bought as part of the Book of the Month Club and sat on the coffee table and nobody in his right mind ever read the whole thing. Right? Um, and it's somewhat fatuous. It does have an idea at the center of it that great leadership only emerges in great crises. Remember, Bill Clinton was upset that he wasn't going to rank high in the presidential sweepstakes after he retired because he never had a great crisis to manage. You know, I guess Monica Lewinsky was not. <laughs> but, um, now, this is a plausible in interpretive posture, although we can all think of lots of times when there are great crises and leadership doesn't Right? Like now. <laughs> <laughs> or Europe in 1914. Um, so it's an explanation, it's a perhaps a necessary but not a sufficient explanation. So that leads to the question, well, what was it about the crisis of 1776 that gave it that kind of power and potency? And I don't have an answer to that, but I have a story that contains within it a kind of answer. It's about Washington. When Washington is getting ready to leave to go to the Continental Congress in May of 1775, think about it, Lexington and Concord have just happened. There's a weird thing here that most people don't think about. Think about Historians are always committed to chronology. Chronology might be the last refuge of the feeble-minded, but for historians, <laughs> We gotta stick with chronology, okay? This happened. Notice the war starts 15 months before we declare independence. The war starts in April of 75. We don't declare independence until July 4th. So there's this gap. We're gonna come back to that. But Washington puts on his military uniform, partly because it's the only suit of clothes that fits him. And he says to his manager at Mount Vernon, Lund Washington, his second cousin, Lund, now listen to this, when the British come up the Potomac to burn Mount Vernon, please get out my books and Martha, presumably not necessarily in the <laughs> He 
expected that he was going to lose everything. So when Jefferson, 15 months later, writes the words um, that our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, he wasn't being rhetorical. If you sided with the independence movement, you were a traitor. And if you look at what happens to the people, there are 58 people that signed the Declaration. A lot of them end up getting hanged and tortured and losing everything. He's ready to lose everything. Three years later, in 1778, Blunt writes Washington and says, oh, a British frigate came up the Potomac and anchored off Mount Vernon. And I thought, uh-oh. So I sent a little skiff out with gifts and fruit <laughs> to try to appease the captain of the frigate. And I got on board and I talked to him and he said, I'm here just fishing for herring. <laughs> he didn't know it was Mount Vernon. So Blunt says, you know, isn't that great? We missed, you know. Washington writes back, says, I am extraordinarily distressed to hear what you have told me. You have stained my honor. If it happens again, tell them it's Mount Vernon and let them burn it to the ground. Well, there's something in the chemistry of that moment that creates that kind of atmosphere. And the people like Washington who see where history's headed are prepared to pay the ultimate price. I mean, I think you've got to be crazy to run for president of the United States these days. I mean, only psychopaths end up running. And, um, <laughs> um, but it's not every, it's not your life. Well, maybe it is, but it's, anyway. Um, a second question that comes, that is in the book. Was the war inevitable? Was the American Revolution and the movement for independence in 1776 unavoidable and inevitable? Or was it avoidable? The answer here is pretty clear. It was avoidable. What do I mean? Well, notice there's this 15-month gap, right? And the war has started, and Bunker Hill happens in June 15th of 75. That's a bloodbath. British lose over half their force. British general says another victory like this and the British army will be annihilated. <laughs> they ban at all the wounded American soldiers. Um, which creates martyrs like Joseph Warren. Um, but during this 50, here's another phrase from Jefferson. Prudence dictates the governments ought not be changed for light and transient causes. And during this 15-month period, the majority of people in the Continental Congress believe there is a way out of this. The main spokesman for that moderate group, which is a majority, is a guy from um, Delaware and Pennsylvania, he lives in both places, John Dickinson. Dickinson is an underappreciated figure because he gets it wrong, although in the end he signs up and fights for the Continental Army. What do the moderates think we ought to do? Well, it's easy. Look. What are we saying? We're saying you can't tax us and Parliament cannot now even legislate for us. It's not just taxes, but you can't bring troops in and put them on us, that kind of thing. Why don't we simply say that you recognize our right to legislate for ourselves in our own colonial assemblies, and we'll stay in the empire and recognize the authority of the king and be part of the British Empire economically, because it's beneficiary for both of us. And both Edmund Burke and <coughs> William Pitt made the same arguments in the House of Lords and the House of Commons at the same time. 
The fact that they don't do this will be the biggest blunder in the history of British statecraft. Why don't they do it? If they had done it, guess what? They would have discovered the British Commonwealth a hundred years earlier. And we would have remained in the empire probably for a hundred years. And then gradually moved away like Australia and Canada and those other places. But it didn't happen that way. Why not? There were three reasons why the British were unwilling to consider that conciliatory moderate position. One, William Blackstone, the great English jurist, had written in 1765 a treatise in which the central argument was that sovereignty in any government or any empire must be singular. There must be one place you can go to for final resolution of all constitutional political questions. And in the British Empire, that place was Parliament. Actually, Parliament and the King. Therefore, we cannot recognize the authority and sovereignty of colonial assemblies any more than we can recognize the existence of many gods rather than one god. So it's not possible. By the way, notice the United States creates many gods because nobody knows where, what sovereignty lies in the Constitution. <clears throat> Second, an early version of the domino theory. What happens if we do what you want to, us to do? What happens in Canada? What happens in Ireland? What happens in India? They will all want the same thing. And we can't have that. Therefore, unacceptable. Third reason, we're sending the largest amphibious force ever assembled across the Atlantic to squash this thing, and you have absolutely no chance of winning the war. In other words, we don't need to do this we're going to be able to impose our will militarily. And there's nothing you can do about it. We are the greatest military power on the planet. The British Army is not the best army. The Prussian Army is the best army. The French Army is almost as good. But you put the British Army and the British Navy together, you've got the most powerful military force on the planet. Think about it. Between 1750 and 1950, how many wars did Great Britain lose? Now, you might count Afghanistan somewhere. But that wasn't really a war. And, um, um, so, for those reasons, the British are in transit. Um, if you want to understand why and how the uh, commitment to independence congeals and galvanizes in the spring and summer of 76, because it's not present before that. Guys like Adams are radicals. New England's different, because New England's occupied. And so they are prepared to rock and roll, but the rest of the colonies are not, especially in New York and Pennsylvania, where there's a lot of loyalists. And then many people like Quakers who don't want to go to war. Let me cover my train of thought here. That the galvanizing effect occurs because of a resolution composed by Adams that nobody knows about, but you have been reading this brilliant book will immediately recognize the its importance. On May 15th, it's a resolution the Continental Congress sends to all the colonial governors to be sent to their legislatures. It says, we would ask each colony to rewrite its constitution or charter, not as a colonial charter or constitution, but as a state constitution. This is a vote on independence. I mean, you're not going to revise your charter 
as an independent state if you're claiming that you're going to stay in the empire. And there's a big debate on this in the Congress, but it passes. And they send this all, they send this to all the colonies. Back in the 19th century, there was a guy called Charles Force, who was an archivist in Boston, who before the revolutionary generation had completely died off, wanted to gather every piece of information he possibly could. And it was published in 10 huge, each volume, 1,000 pages. And it's in research libraries in the United States. Williams has it, Mount Holyoke has it, Amherst has it, UMass has it. It's called American Archive. Nobody knows about this because it is impossible. It, it's not edited. It doesn't have an index. It's, you know, it's just all this stuff thrown together. And you've got to sort of really go to 10 volumes. But one of the things that's in there is we know. Let's take, take Massachusetts, okay? There are 49 towns in Massachusetts then. Every town wrote back to say what it thought. The same thing in Vermont, the same, oh, Vermont doesn't really exist at that time, right? Um, uh, and they all say the same thing, pretty much. We can't believe we're saying this. If you had asked us this question six months ago, we would have had a different answer. But we no longer have a choice. All constitutional arguments are no longer relevant. It's not we've sat down and debated the right of taxation or all that. No. We are being invaded. The British Army is coming to kill us and rape our women. And they've hired 15,000 Hessians who are known to take no prisoners. We have no choice. We cannot just declare independence of George III because he has already declared independence of us. The reason that independence comes together at that moment isn't the political arguments that they've been making for over 10 years. It's the military fact of an invasion. That's what changes it. Once you put troops into the situation, it changes everything. And that means the whole colonies now have the, the situation facing Massachusetts at the time. Okay. Why do we celebrate and the birthday of American independence on the 4th of July? This is the kind of thing you can play games with. You, know, you can win Jeopardy contests with this one. <clears throat> what happened on the 4th of July? Nothing. <laughs> Here's the story. There is a resolution from the Virginia delegation written by Richard Henry Lee that says, that they're going to have to vote on. That these colonies are and have every right to be independent states. That's what it says. By the way, notice, the colonies are not, re not rebelling as a nation. The first sentence in the most famous speech in American history is wrong. Four score and seventy years ago, our forefathers brought forth in this continent a new nation. No, they didn't. They brought forth a confederation of sovereign states provisionally united to get, come together for the war and then go their separate ways. They voted on this on July 2nd. On July 3rd, Adams writes to his beloved and ever saucy Abigail, <laughs> Portia, yesterday, July 2nd, will be today we celebrate American independence. There will be parades, there will be banquets, there will be speeches, there will be illuminations. He gets everything right, right down to the fireworks. But he gets the day wrong. Because he thinks the day is the day they voted on independence. Makes sense. There is a famous painting, you've seen it, and if I had an audiovisual support, I'd throw it up on the organ back there. Um, <laughs> by John Trumbull. You can look it up when you go home on, on the internet. Just write Trumbull Declaration of Independence. The original hangs in the rotunda of the Capitol. It shows five guys 
coming up to a desk in which somebody's sitting. The five guys are, Walsh, uh, are Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, William Livingston, who nobody knows about, and a guy from Connecticut, <laughs> whose, name, whose name I can't remember. I keep forgetting his name. <laughs> the guy at the desk is John Hancock. <laughs> if you look it up, some of the site of the pictures will show, they will say July 4th, 1776. So you think, this is the signing ceremony. In the play, 1776, remember, that's how the play ends, right? They all come up and they sign, except that never happened. <laughs> that picture isn't July 4th. It is June 28th. <laughs> it is the committee that drafted the declaration presenting that draft to the full Congress, which they then have to debate on July 2nd and 3rd, or the last half of the 2nd and 3rd. The only thing they do on the 4th is send it to the printer. <laughs> That's all they do. But on the top of the original document, the printer in Philadelphia says July 4th, 1776. So that's on the document. And that's why it becomes the 4th. Most of them sign it on August 2nd. But they're signing it because there's comings and goings in Philadelphia in November. It's funny, some of the people that sign it last, you know, like there's this guy called uh, Morris, John Morris. Uh, John Morris. Yeah. Morris signs it. He's reluctant. Very reluctant. But he puts his name at the top. <laughs> and I'm like, they're all there. I said, okay, I put my nose. Um, so the fourth's always been the wrong day. And I think that both Adams and Jefferson, now later things happen, like the Louisiana Purchase uh, arrives in Washington on July 4th, 1803. Thoreau goes out to Walden on July 4th, 1846, although he does it because of you know, Lee retreats from Gettysburg on July 4th, 1863. So you know, God is saying something here. And um, But the real reason that it's now okay is because Adams and Jefferson, knowing that it was the wrong day, decided to make it the right day. You know what I'm saying? They both died on July 4th. 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration. They died on schedule. Those guys could will it up. Madison tried to make it to the 4th. He missed by one day, July 3rd, 1830. Monroe hit it on the notes, July 4th, 1830. There are all these guys who are going to die on schedule. And so it's okay for the 4th. Um, I want to only take about 10 more minutes and and then leave 15 minutes. I said it's 8.20, but we'll leave 15 minutes for this. Third big question. How did we win the war? Now, I've told you the British think there's no way they can lose. And from a conventional military point of view, they're right. And in doing the research for this book, I did a lot of work on the Continental Army. Let me tell you, the Continental Army is a bunch of ragamuffins. These are not guys you want living in your neighborhood. Um, and um, if you take, think about it, it's really difficult to create an army de novo. An army takes all kinds of regulations, you know, quartermaster corps, commissary, hospitals, how do you decide on rank, all kinds of stuff. And then discipline has to be internalized. Most of the guys in the Continental Army in the first year of the war elected their own officers. When they didn't like what they said, they said, screw it, we're not going to do that. They relieved themselves wherever they wanted to. Um, and the militia, in the, in the, the militia outside in, in New York on Manhattan and, and Long Island are half the force. There's 28,000 troops, 15,000 are militia. There's the myth of the militia, right? Total nonsense. The militia run away. 
they just the reason they're so successful is they're never captured because they run away. <laughs> you can't count them. They they have no discipline. Um, so from a traditional military point of view, this is a no-brainer. And Washington himself, at the end of the war, says. The American victory will be regarded by historians as a, this is quoting him, a standing miracle. <laughs> now, I don't know what a sitting miracle or a lying miracle looks like, but you get the point. Somehow, this shouldn't have happened this way, but it did. And that's a plausible take on it. And then we have to figure out, you know, how this miracle happened. There's another way to see it. And I think our own experience in Southeast Asia and the Middle East makes us sensitive in a way that we hadn't been before to the strategic dilemma facing the British Army. Okay? And so the other option is they never had a chance. I think that's the right answer. There's a meeting on Staten Island on September 11th, 1776. Context, the American army has just had the stuffings kicked out of it on Long Island. New York is indefensible because it's an archipelago. Whoever controls the sea controls the battle. There's no question about who controls the sea. The average law, tenure of time for a British officer was 27 years. The average time for a regular soldier was seven years. The average time for an American officer was six months, and the average time for a regular soldier was less than six months. They get beat, they get the, the most, here's the, I think the most significant, consequential military engagement in the entire war isn't Bunker Hill, Saratoga, Yorktown, or even Washington's victory at Trenton on Christmas night. Those are, in, you know, those are important moments, to be sure. It's on August 31st, 1776, when the entire Continental Army, 20,000 troops, get across the East River at night. The Brits can't believe they did it. Everything had to work perfectly. The wind had to be right, the currents had to be right, a fog had to come in, the British had to be not watching. Perfect storm, benevolent perfect storm. They get off, they get off on and they get to Manhattan. So they they were trapped. They would have been completely annihilated. They, they still run the same risk in Manhattan if they cork the top of Manhattan, but they won't do that. Anyway, the British Admiral Richard Howe, brother of William Howe, the general, really wants the colonists to recognize that this is a lost cause. And that uh, we've just showed you in this battle in Long Island, you can't possibly win. So, for God's sakes, let's stop this slaughter. Let's step back from independence. We're now prepared to meet the terms that you yourselves offer. We'll allow you to recognize your, your right to legislate and tax yourselves. Now, he doesn't really have the authority to do that. And they call him. But there's a meeting in Staten Island. The Continental Congress sends Adams, Franklin, and a guy from uh, South Carolina named Edward Rutledge. And Howe says, I don't want to kill all you guys. And my, you know I'm a Whig. I voted against this war when I was a member of the House of Lords. He did. I don't want to be the person to prosecute this war against you. Come to your senses. Step back from independence. Recover, return to the empire. Adams takes the lead. No way. First of all, we don't have the authority to do this because everybody voted on this. And, um, and too much has happened. Too many people have died. Too many women in New England have been raped along the coast. If you had said this a year ago, yes. But that was then and this is now. And 
to the question of our military ineptitude, who cares whether we lose an army? We'll just get a new army. The American population can produce an army of 100,000 troops. The 18 to 45 year old population is inexhaustible. It's the same thing Ho Chi Minh says to the Americans in 1966. You can't win. You can't win. You don't think we can win. We're saying you can't win. And Franklin says the same thing. Franklin says, well, you know, you spent all this money to take these little islands. If you spent all that money, you know, on the whole country, you'd be bankrupt. This is like, he says this, the crusades for you. You're going to come back just as defeated as the crusaders did. And Lord Richard, I'm a good friend of yours. We knew each other in London. My sincere plea to you is to recognize your own honor and your own reputation will be best served by you taking your fleet and going back to England. So the American position is, this is not a war just of armies. This is a war between two peoples. You can win a war of armies. You can't win a war of people. So when does it become a war of peoples, a war for hearts and minds and not just for territory? It happens, the beginning of it happens in the summer of 76. Washington is psychologically and characteristically a conventional thinker about war. And he's a very honor-driven man. He thinks that if the British present themselves on the field, it's like a summons to duel. You can't say no. It's like, have you ever noticed this? You know, in a battle, in an 18th century battle, guys stay standing up when the other guys are going to fire at them. Why in God's name do you do that? Why don't you lie down? Why don't you get behind someone? Huh? Cannonballs are knocking off people's heads and disemboweling them next to you. But it's honor driven to stand there at attention. Crazy. But part of a military and chivalric tradition is very much alive. Washington needs to realize that that is the wrong strategy or the wrong tactic. Washington begins thinking he has to win the war. Notice this. This is big. He comes to the conclusion he doesn't have to win. He just has to not lose. The British have to win. That changes the whole ballgame. Think about it. Who are some of the greatest generals in world history? Hannibal, Napoleon, Rommel, Robert E. Lee. They're all losers. <laughs> Every one of them is a loser. Washington loses more battles than he wins, but he's a winner. And he wins because he understands how to fight the war. And he adopts from that point forward, although it goes against his every instinct, what he calls, it's not quite a guerrilla war because it is a conventional army, okay? The thing, everybody's looking for the center of the rebellion. Is the center of the rebellion in New York? Is the center of the rebellion in the Hudson Corridor? They actually have a plan, by the way. New Englanders should know this. How lands in New York, 15,000 troops will then be available to go up the Hudson, for the rest occupy. There will be 8,000 coming down from Lake Champlain under General Burgoyne. They join forces at the Hudson. They will then have a force of nearly 30,000 troops. And those 30,000 troops will walk march across western New England to Boston, devastate the country, seal off New England, the cradle of the rebellion, it'll end right there. Now I think if they ever tried to move across the country, even with 30,000 troops, they were going to end up in trouble. Because once you go inland and you don't have the Navy, you're a deep dog, a dog dude. That's what happens to them at Saratoga. Nevertheless, that's their plan. Washington decides to fight what he calls a war of posts. A war of posts means you don't fight unless you have a tactical advantage in numbers or terrain. The, the center of the rebellion isn't a place. The center of the rebellion is the army. 
as long as the Continental Army stays intact, we can't lose. And if you think about it, we don't win the war, they just decide to give up after your time. When they give up, they got 25,000 troops in America. They're occupying parts of the South. They got all these people there. I mean, they could have kept going, but back in London, they're saying, oh, we just can't do this anymore. So, that's how we win the war. Um, I said I would add a thought that is probably imposing my political convictions here, that comes out of this last Harangamana. There's this woman at the LA Times named Susan Brennan, who's the op editor, and for reasons beyond my ken, she always wants me to write stuff for her. <laughs> so, when the Iraq War was in, getting pretty bad, about 2007, she says, I want you to do a piece saying, what would Washington say about and do about Iraq? <laughs> So I said, you know, well, you know, I'm a good historian. I got a PhD from Yale and all that good shit. And, um, and um, I said, well, Washington wouldn't know where Iraq was. <laughs> like, he wouldn't know about jihad. He wouldn't know about Saddam Hussein or anything like that. He said, well, but, you know, we could tell him about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, that was then and this is now. Shut up, Joe. Just write the piece, okay? So I wrote this piece. And basically the piece said, Washington would have said, I don't get it, we've become the British. <laughs> and I think, to switch the normal way we do it, I think I'm learning about our current dilemma in the Middle East by studying the war that we fought against Britain. And the difficulty any major power has in a counterinsurgency uh, operation in an occupation of a foreign land. Um, it's very difficult to pull off unless you're willing to stay forever. And the Brits were willing to stay forever in places like Egypt. We're not willing to stay forever. And um, we're the first world power that's a democracy. And we're the first world power to have an anti-imperial origin. So, you know what I think. <laughs> That's enough. I would like, I would like to see if you have any questions. This man's right in the front. He's got to get, and then I'll see somebody over there. Yes, sir. Yes, are you uh, aware that you have just described the war that, the, that Obama lost in Ukraine? You described it so precisely. So stunningly, what has I'm just I'm so been... impressed, but I don't think I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Why, what do you mean? He never, we never fought a war in the Ukraine. First of all, we perpetrated a coup d'etat there with the CIA and the U.S. State Department. Uh, no, we didn't do that. Wait. This is bullshit. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. I... Now, come on. Yeah. I have to. I hear you. I, 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 I tell you what, after we're finished here, I will come and we will sit down and talk. But I think we have a limited amount of time here. Yes. I don't want you to have the floor. <laughs> yes, sir. Excuse me, but I will talk to you. You Thank began you. by discussing the ecological impact noted by the walruses. Or yes. And I'm interested in your experience as a historian for how we might solve the ecological crisis that we face today. Oh boy. All right, I, I thought about this because I wrote a piece with my son, also for the LA Times. They publish anything I throw at them. And, um, <laughs> point one, the ecological crisis is the kind of national security threat. I think it's a national security threat. I think it's the biggest threat to our people and our generation that we have much more than terrorism. You know, you can show pictures of the walruses and you can show pictures of the glaciers and all that stuff, but you can't show pictures of people's throats being cut. It's designed almost perfectly to be the kind of problem that democracies have a very difficult time dealing with. 
You know the story of the frog and the, and the kettle? Yes. You put the frog in the kettle and it's, the water's boiling, the frog will jump out of the kettle. But if you keep the water tepid, put the frog in, and then light the fire, the frog will die because it will be a gradual kind of death. That's what we're facing. And the political system of the United States isn't prepared to handle that. This is not to mention the obvious fact that there are climate change deniers on the right side of the spectrum, most of whom come from oil or coal states. In Ohio, <coughs> Oklahoma, it is in charge of a science committee that blocks all carbon retention legislation. Um, I would love it if when on CNN, scrolling beneath, Instead of having football scores or the, uh, the uh, stock market, when you got somebody you know, from Congress talking, say, here is where he gets his money from. Yeah. 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 So, right now, gridlock. There's nothing we're going to get through the Congress. Nothing. They will block it. And as I say, 100 years from now, we'll look upon them as a bunch of idiots. But that's too late. What can we do? We can do one thing now. I mean, all of us can do individual things. We know about, you know, taking care of Vermont's ahead of most of the country in, in terms of uh, other sources of energy. The biggest contributor to climate change, to, to uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is deforestation. Deforestation throws more carbon into the atmosphere than automobiles, planes, all forms of uh, transportation combined. If you stop deforestation, you do two things. Not only do you stop that, but trees are God's gift to the planet as absorbers of carbon. Trees absorb twice as much carbon as they release when cut. That means if you, if you actually were able to implement a deforestation program in Amazon, Congo Basin, and Indonesia, where the tropical forests are, and where deforestation is happening, you would reduce uh, the impact of climate change by 30%. And we can do that. We've got, to give the, we've got to give the IMF or the United Nations about $20 billion to subsidize Brazil, and, other, and Indonesia for this kind of thing. But it's something you can do because it doesn't require legislation on our part. It's, Obama can do it. And believe me, if the, if the Republicans win the House and the Senate in the November elections, they're going to start impeachment proceedings against Obama because of his executive action on immigration and on climate change. And that will take up the whole two years. But he can act. The meeting in Lima in, uh, in December and then the meeting in Paris the following year, those are big meetings. If deforestation is done, it can make an impact on that. The best we can do for our kids and our grandkids is to maximize whatever the way we have available to us now. And that's it, as far as I can tell. When I was driving up from Amherst or up on 91, you know, both sides of the road are full of trees. You realize how much carbon dioxide those trees are sucking up? Should be planted. They're doing this in India. You should plant trees by every goddamn, excuse me, every internet, interstate highway system. But the biggest group of trees is in the tropics. And that's huge, really huge. There's a piece in the Times today on Brazil with regard to this. I already debate about this. Yes, sir. First, I love your books. Thank you. Um, this is the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. As I've watched the series of the New York Times, Artists, the blog posts, I've come to realize how deeply racism is entrenched in our gridlocked constitution. That's an 18th century subject. Do you have any, would you like to comment on, uh, yeah. on, on, on the book that's sitting there about race in America from, the, from that constitution? Slavery with racism, certainly where I write it at its foundation, is embedded in the constitution, or was. The ways in which it was embedded, specifically with the three-fifths requirement to vote and the delay of 20 years before we end the slave trade, those are the two things. Both of those things are out. There's nothing in the, in the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments after the, after the Civil War did away with the, the original mistakes 
that were made in the 1787 doctrine. By the way, those people who are abolitionists about slavery and think the founders screwed up, think about this. If they had said, we're going to face this and make rules against slavery and put it on the road to gradual emancipation, the Constitution would have never passed. Right. That's part of my point. Yeah. Essential compromise. It was. It was a sectional, not sexual, but sectional compromise. And, um, but without that compromise, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. In other words, in some ways, they delayed the, the, the moment until you get a Lincoln who's going to be able to act on it. What would have happened if they hadn't done that and they faced it? The South would have seceded from the Union. They would have had a separate confederacy down there. And slavery would have been even more protected. Um, what will happen when the British Empire ends slavery in 1831? I don't know. I think the South, would have, if we were still in the empire, they would have seceded from that. Um, so these are tough, tough choices. But I don't think racism problem. Now, racism is present. And the notion that because we elected President Obama, we're into a post-racist society is probably the biggest fiction we can possibly imagine. Um, no president in American history has run through more death threats than President Obama. Why is that? Okay. And the lunatic fringe on the right, and I'm, I'm not castigating all Republicans on this one, um, you know, and the pervasive sense that he's really a Muslim or he was not born. In, you know, this is just, you know, just crazy. And it's, at its roots, there's something that I think is racist. What we have to realize is story. This is the one contribution I can make as a story. Even people who wanted to end slavery in the late 18th century, up to people at Lincoln's time, including Lincoln until the very end, including uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe in her novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. The appendix of Uncle Tom's Cabin says, once they're free, here's where we'll send them. Liberia. Liberia, the Caribbean, Panama, what was Tom's Cabin. In other words, the presumption that you could have a biracial society did not exist. It's a mid-20th century idea. Or something that we commit ourselves to in, say, Brown versus Board of Education and the Civil Rights Act. So that, uh, that it's a hell of a lot to have... Jefferson, this was his big argument why he couldn't do anything about slavery, because how the hell... And you free him, and then you know the cost of sending them is are prohibitive. He had another reason. <laughs> he had other reasons too. He did. Um, uh, I guess you're thinking about Sally Hennings, but um, um, by the way, he never frees Sally. He frees all of Sally's children, but he never frees Sally. His daughter frees Sally a year after he dies. And here's the thing: you know, people say I'm talk talking too much here, but people say, you know, why didn't Jefferson free slaves? There are a bunch of reasons, but one reason, legally, he didn't own them. His creditors owned them. He was $10 million, the equivalent of $10 million in debt. Those were collateral that his creditors wouldn't let him sell. Um, okay, time for one more. Yes, sir? I have some of my own notions on this, but of course, the first thing you think about, what is it in today's crisis, as you described, um, that was perhaps missed in the founding of the country that has led us to where we are now. See if I rephrase this correctly. What is it about the founding era and especially the Constitution that has lingered on as a source of problem that afflicts us today? There are some people, James McGregor Burns, the recently dead uh, guy who's uh, uh, written about this in leadership a lot, he wants to have a new, he wanted to have a new constitutional convention. Now that's not going to happen. And, um, but I understand why Jim thought that. I disagree with him on this, and here's my somewhat moderate position. The Constitution is not perfect. Nothing is in this world. But the primary problems we're facing with gridlock are not a function of anything structurally in the Constitution. They're a function of money, the average time that a House of Representatives delegate puts on raising money is 70% of his or her time in office. 
70 percent. I guess that was exactly my Okay. The, the other thing is the filibuster. There's nothing in the Constitution about the filibuster. The filibuster is a set of Senate rules that have been adopted in somewhat strange ways over the last 30 years, so you don't even have to filibuster. Um, and I think the filibuster as currently practiced is unconstitutional. Somebody ought to put this before the courts. Um, so I think it's what we've done to the Constitution rather than what was inherently in it um, that is the problem. <coughs> follow up. Yeah, but follow up is absolutely agree about the money piece. Do you think it was except, could have been possible at that time to then to recognize the power of commercial interests, or it just was beyond the can of people at that time to see that? They couldn't even imagine political parties. So that they that those were a surprise thing for them. And they thought they were bad things. Jefferson who founds the first political party, right? Jefferson could, you know, pass a lie detector test on all the horrible things he did. And um, uh, he said, if I must die, I, I would, with, with regard to parties, if I must die uh, and go to heaven, I, in a political party, I prefer not to go at all. Um, they go out of parties as the same way we think of lobbyists. Okay? So, I think in terms of the influence of money, they're aware of that. Franklin proposed uh, uh, that in the Congress, and everybody laughed this off, that uh, elected officials should not be paid. Um, but that one didn't make any sense. And um, I think they couldn't foresee the Gilded Age. They couldn't foresee the second Gilded Ages, which is uh, what we're living in. To expect them of greatness is fine. To expect them of omniscience is ridiculous. <laughs> If you brought them forward, they say, let's us have another Second Continental Congress. Although, you know, the reason it worked is because 55 white guys got together in secret and colluded to do this. All of our commitment to openness, transparency, and diversity had to be thrown out the window for that to work. So if you tried to do this in, in our own way now, you'd never be able to get consensus at all. It would, it would fail. It's time. It's past time. I appreciate your attention. I'm going to go back there. And